Well, good morning. Good morning. Everybody doing okay? Healthy as an ox. <laughs> it's great to see all you folks here this morning. It's a great blessing to see you. All right, we're going to start off this morning because he lives. Stand. Let's stand. Let's Just 
Uh, they would sense that you are there, that you are uh, drawing them to yourself, and Lord, that you would reveal yourself to many today, and that many would come to saving faith in Christ. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we can greet each other. We just don't have to shake hands. All right, guys? <laughs> Thank you, Matt. You're keeping me in line. All right. I think we have another song here. We can put that up. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away? My goodness. They started the packing of the shoe, uh, shoe boxes. Um, not, not yet. Yeah, that's right. And then there's a ladies' Bible study on the 10th at 9 a.m. Uh, to finish up our study for the book of the year. Uh, and are doing that here at the church? Yes. Oh, okay. And then on Saturday the 27th, there'll be a yard sale here at the church parking lot. All sales will go towards the cost of Operation Christmas Child Box Ministry. And if you have any items that you would like to donate to the yard sale, contact Autumn Schmeling for that uh, to arrange for a pickup or drop off at the church. And uh, the missionaries to pray for uh, this week are Steve and Glenda. 
uh, Mentozo, right? With Wycliffe Bible translations. And, uh, and then our family to pray for is Scott and Andrea Long, uh, who can't be with us because they live in Canada. They can't cross the border. But uh, I think that's all for the announcements, right? You're the man. Uh, lots of anniversaries going on here. Uh, so make sure you, if you pick up one of these here, uh, Jeff and Diane, John and Noma, Donna and Estelle, Tom and Linda, Ben and Lydia. Oh, okay. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements in relation to our opening here. And uh, good to see many of you here uh, at the, in the building with us. And then I know there's some that are joining us online as well. And we have set up... Um, a simulcast stream that goes to YouTube also, so the YouTube live, and I know that most people are, are joining us right now on Facebook, and that's fine. There are some that do not have Facebook, so if you know of anybody like that, and because I, I know that they look at the stuff afterwards when I've been uploading it to YouTube, but now we're doing it live, and uh, they can find that under Matawaska Gospel Church on YouTube and they'll find our channel and they should see that so just an announcement for those that are online and to get that word out to those that um, would like to join us that way and also we do have uh, I think we're just under the limit here for what we can host in this meeting uh, we do have an overflow set up now in the fellowship hall and again that's in keeping with the recommendations that uh, have come down for opening safely and all that and we're trying to do that where we can and we have that set up with chairs and a, a TV that's in there that's uh, actually looking at the live stream on YouTube. So it's uh, maybe 10, 15 six seconds delayed from here, but it's essentially live. And uh, that's in there. So uh, you guys are, you know, in the future, if you want to use that, feel free to. Um, I know some sometimes you need to step out or whatever, and that's available. There's seats in there and all that. And uh, that's just the only announcements I have. So uh, we, we have plenty of space in this facility to host uh, two groups under one roof, but separate. Uh, and so that uh, is, you know, it's good. And we're trying to, again, just as people feel they can come back, I want you to know that we've uh, taken precautions. Uh, we've uh, you noticed in our auditorium here, we've spaced out our chairs and uh, asked people to sit by families and keep a little distance between each other and all that. And so that's, that's the update on those things. Um, I'm hoping that things just continue to go back eventually to normal, whatever that is. And I'm not sure we were ever a normal church, really. But anyways, that's right. As long as I'm here, it won't be normal. That's right. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I, I'm looking at the bulletin there in uh, uh, Jacob, uh, birthday today. I would have loved to see him come that aisle. Jacob Gugliamo. <laughs> but he's not here today but if he's listening happy birthday all right we got another song uh, up there uh, Lydia or Ben or Randy or one of you <laughs> it is well with my soul <clears throat>
We're in the Gospel of John, Gospel of John, and we've been in this study now for some time, and again, good to see you folks here this morning, and we have been looking at uh, journeying through John, as I say, as we go down through this Gospel account. Uh, there are four writers of the what we call the Gospels, the opening of the New Testament, these four books, and each one examines the life and ministry of Christ here on earth, but also his eternality. John particularly focuses on that, the deity of Christ. And uh, we've been looking at these various things. John actually records several miracles that are really prove that Jesus was more than just a man. He was a man, 100% man, but he was also God. And that's the great mystery of the incarnation that has been revealed in the Bible that God put on flesh. And as we looked at this study beginning way back um, many months ago now, and we've looked at it, and again, John opens up his gospel with the eternal word, a word who is personified, right? The word who became flesh and who dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, even as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, last time we were in the Gospel of John, a few weeks ago now, we were looking at the feeding of the multitude in John chapter 6. And from that, and I, I think that title slide, I forgot to update it. We're actually beyond this. We are now in Faith in the Storm, okay, is the title. And I, that slips through there because I, I don't see it well. And that's probably what it is on the little thing. So I'm using excuses as an old man now. That's it. But... Uh, I need to update that. If you want the title, it's Faith in the Storm, and it's John chapter 6, verses 15 to 21. And we're going to begin there in John 15, and looking at that. It says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. And then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Father, again, we look to you this morning to open up your word to us, to us and, and Lord, I pray that you would uh, again meet the needs of those that are, are listening to this this morning in this message here, and as we open it and study it, Lord, that you would just teach us as only you can. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and the power he has over, over nature, as God of creation, the Lord of creation, we thank you, Lord, that you are the one who's revealed yourself as such. And we now ask again, you be glorified in this message this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This uh, miracle, and there's really several miracles that are found here in this. Uh, there's the one, Jesus leaves, remember, the feeding of the multitude feeding of thousands of people, perhaps up to 20,000 people, because the men are numbered as 5,000, uh, and that was uh, the, the numbering of them, but there were also women and children, it says, beside that. And then from there, as Jesus and the disciples are used in that miracle to feed this crowd, um, people kind of rallied, they came, and they wanted to make Jesus king. And I find that sort of interesting, because um, that's typical of human nature. If, if you get something from somebody, uh, you want to make sure they're the guys in charge, right? And so people have discovered that over the years. We're going to either uh, appoint them king or uh, vote them into office or whatever if I can get fed. Now, that seems to be what the crowd was doing here when, uh, G once Jesus had fed them. Uh, they said, this is the one. We've got to keep him here. Let's make him king. Well, he was not going to take that position of authority yet. And his timing was not there. So Jesus withdraws himself and first telling his disciples to get in a boat. 
And Mark and Matthew also record this same event. They actually include more details than John does. Nevertheless, we find that not only was there a great feeding of the multitude, but then the disciples get in a boat and a great storm comes up. And in the middle of the storm, we find Jesus walking on the water. That's in Matthew's account and Mark's account. And remember, one of them in Matthew's account, Peter gets out of the boat. He walks on the water. Uh, he fall, first starts to go below the waves. And he uh, says one of the shortest prayers that Peter probably are, ever said. Lord, save me. And that's all he could get out before he would have been underwater. And the Lord certainly saved him in that. And uh, then, not only that, that Jesus calms the waves. There was a great calm that takes place. And then according to this, immediately when Jesus got in the boat, they ended up on the other shore. So there's several parts of a miracle here, or miracles, I guess, if you want to compartmentalize them, that go on in this short little text. Now, it was done at night, and it wasn't something as visible as the feeding of the 5,000. Um, and I'm not sure how visible that was. They just began to pass out fish and bread, and it continued to multiply as they passed it out in the basket. I'm sure some were thinking, how big is that basket that you're holding, you know? Uh, but they knew that Jesus, and again, the disciples knew that this was someone who is indeed uh, different, right, for sure. And Jesus had already done many miracles in their presence. We learn a little bit about the disciples in the other text, too. Um, some of it was that their heart had become hard. And I thought of that. I thought in the middle of seeing great miracles occur and walking with Jesus here on this earth and listening to his teaching, is it possible that his closest followers could have hard hearts? Hmm. Yeah, the answer is yes, because that's what the Bible says. Their hearts were hardened. And it was only after Jesus would calm the waves that they would really stand in awe of him and be amazed at what he had done. Well, a lot of things could be said here uh, about this, but I, I want to actually go to the other two gospel accounts and read those uh, as those writers include extra details. And as I always say, when you study the Bible, you need to study it as a harmony of the Bible. In other words, if, if one book uh, has some reference or account of another, you know, that appears in another book of the Bible, another portion of the Bible, you should always study those things together and they harmonize. I, you always find that. Some people say, well, they must contradict because John doesn't include Peter walking on the water. Ha, I mean, it must not happen then. Well, Matthew does include it. So when you look at that, again, one gospel writer uh, gives a, a more detail than the other because that was the emphasis, all right? There, we have a story of Peter, and we can focus in on Peter, and sometimes we're all like Peter, you know? We don't really, we're, we're apt to get out of the boat, but our faith wavers really quickly. And John is focusing on the deity of Christ. He is the one who has the power over the waves. He has the power over nature itself. He has the power to convey a boat immediately to the other shore. All of those different things. And each one of these you need to represent. So we're going to go to Matthew's account first, and I'll just read down through these. And then we're going to tie them together. And I'm going to, you know, this morning's message kind of build out of all three of these passages, okay? Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by wave, the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid." And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he, came, he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And he began to sink and cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Now you see some different details already from John. Quite a, quite a bit more details than what John provides. Let's read Mark's account. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. For they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. You see, if you look at the parallel of the Gospels or the harmony of the Gospels, you get these extra details. For instance, Mark includes the detail that their heart was hard. John doesn't say that. Matthew doesn't say that. We, we find Matthew and Mark both say that Jesus went up alone to pray on a mountain as he sent the disciples out. Actually, in Matthew and Mark, it says that he made them get into the boat. All right? He, didn't, he just said, go, all right? You're going to get in the boat. And he wasn't in the boat with them. That's kind of different, isn't it? John doesn't include that. And when you, when you look at these different uh, uh, emphasis uh, and these different things, you, you see that. I'm going to look here, Mark 6.45. And Mark, remember, a man who uh, writes to the Roman mind more than the Jewish mind as he writes his account of the Gospels. And a world filled with Roman soldiers uh, would have very much uh, appealed, or that this book would have appealed to them, in particular Mark's account, because Mark uh, talks about a Christ on a mission. And you find the word immediately used a lot. It's used a couple times in this section in Mark. Immediately. And you know, in a Roman's mind, they would have understood that. When someone gave them an order, they would have, as a soldier, would have immediately obeyed that order. And that's something that uh, is drilled into anybody that has probably served in the military. Um, you learn what now means, you know, and you learn it right away. And that's a key word that is used throughout the Gospel of uh, Mark. But it says immediately he made his disciples. Uh, the Old English, and I think it's, it says constrained them. I, I don't know if it's in this one or in Matthew. And it says, in other words, he told them, you, not, you must get in the boat. And they did. And it says, and go before him to the other side. Now, this is the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Galilee. It's a freshwater lake. And uh, at its widest point, it's somewhere around, I think, eight miles wide. So not a terrible distance if you have a group of men rowing a boat. They can get there unless there's a storm that comes up. Now, that kind of brings us to this whole idea of what is... What does John present? What does Matthew present? What does Mark present? And we see here, uh, first of all, Christ who sends his disciples away. And that is, of course, you know, part of the authority that he has given. And they obey him. And the word that is used in the Greek, which means made you know, or constrained, it, it's to drive them or to force them. And I would say this, that most likely as they got ready to get in the boat, uh, all of them would have been looking over the horizon and seeing, hmm, the weather doesn't look like it's good. I don't know. It doesn't say that. Maybe it was a sunny you know, evening and the sun was setting and now Jesus says, get in the boat, go over there. And they didn't know, obviously, what was coming, but they do. And he makes them get in the boat. And, and I thought of that because sometimes we wonder, um, you know, does why certain things happen in our life? Why do certain storms come up in our life? And why would a good God put me in the middle of a storm? Well, I, I think the answer is found here that he has things to teach us in the middle of the storm. He has ways of making us rely on him in the storm when we will not rely on him anywhere else. And I'm thankful for the storms of life that come. 
I'll tell you, the last three months, we have been in a storm, sort of, here in our society. I can't say it's been terribly disruptive. It's been disruptive, but, you know, uh, there have been some things that, and, and I say that personally, it's been terribly disruptive to some. Some have lost people in the storm of this pandemic. It seems like that's just what everybody talks about. I, I'm tired of talking about it, to be honest with you. But I, I look at it and I think, is it that God put us in the middle of that storm? Yes. A sovereign God did not. Do you think Jesus actually, when he told them to get in the boat, that he didn't know what the weather was going to be like that night? Come on. The one who controls the waves and the sea, he knew exactly what they were going to face. Where does he go? Up on a mountain. There to pray. He's praying. And think about that. Here he is praying um, for whatever, but he's most likely praying for his disciples. We know because he sees them afar off. And they're three or four miles away. Wow. Now, three or four miles, if it's about eight miles distance, that's in the middle of things. And that's what um, the gospel right elsewhere say, in the middle of the sea, it says. In the middle of this great lake. Well, it's important because I realize he sent them. A verse I quote often, Psalm 37, verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. That means the steps that you take, if you're a believer, and you know what? He's working those things out in your life. Isn't that what Romans 8, 28 says? Right? He works everything in that. And you know what? All things work together for good. That's what Romans, to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. He is the one that is working all things out, including even in the times of bad. And you live in a world that is a world that is bad. I have to tell you. I don't know if you realize that. Of course you did. We live in, a, in an awful world sometimes. And you know, just about the time we think, ah, oh, things are going well and it's beautiful and all of a sudden, something bad happens, right? I mean, that's the way human history is, all the way from the garden on. And yet, this loving God, the Creator Lord, entered into that very world, and He took on flesh, and He was tempted, that means tried in every way imaginable, just like we are, and the Bible says, yet without sin. That's the difference between me and Jesus. I'm tempted and I've got sin. But Jesus, he was tempted and tried without sin. He's the great redeemer. And the message of the Bible is a message of redemption that this God that we're estranged from because of our sin and the effects of our sin, you know what? He's come down into where we are and he has called us into his fellowship, back to fellowship. And it's through the person of Jesus Christ. Repenting from our sin and trusting him for salvation. And when Jesus went to the cross and there died at the cross, he took my place. He took the punishment that I deserved. You want to talk about justice and injustice. Ultimately, God's justice resided upon himself as God the Son, as the wrath of God was poured out upon him, where he took my place. I'm the one that should have been executed for my sin. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But he paid my way. He paid your way. You couldn't have paid it. He died on the cross. He was buried. The third day he rose again. Victorious over sin and death. And he calls us to himself. And if you'll follow him. If you'll just trust him by faith. He's promised to save you from your sins. We're going to talk a little more about that as we go through this. There's some things here that I see, and, and again, another verse that I like from uh, talking about the Lord who is at work. Isaiah 45, verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. Hmm. You ever thought about that? That there's things that God allows and does and creates, even calamity, for a greater purpose that we might not understand now. We probably we don't even close, come close to understanding it. And that's the sovereign nature of our God that he is in control of things. And he even allows 
things to happen that create calamity so that somehow his name is further glorified. I often think of that. Um, yesterday was the anniversary of the D-Day invasion landing at, uh, in Normandy. And the Allied troops landed on the continent. And, and then over the next period of a, a year plus, they, they drove back the enemy and liberated Europe. And it was through great calamity. There was a war also in the Pacific that was going on, island to island, and, and just awful things that took place. And I, I would like to someday, I'll probably never have the time, but I'd love to go through and compile stories that are already written in form and, and things that I've heard over the years from people who were alive during those days, some of them serving in very awful conflict and seeing terrible things take place and how God used that in their life to someday get them involved in cross-cultural missionary activity. I think of Stanley Albert Dale. Stanley Albert Dale was a, uh, he was a, a, a soldier in the Australian army and he ended up on some of the Pacific Islands uh, driving back the Japanese during that time and one particular place that he ended up was Papua New Guinea. And it was there in Papua New Guinea and Irinjara, that island that is there, that he first saw some of the most Stone Age, as he put it, Stone Aged people that he'd ever imagined. People that had had very little contact with the outside world for, for thousands of years. Imagine that. He saw them in their sin. Later, God would use him to go back and to be a pioneer missionary. He actually was martyred, but he was a pioneer missionary with the Yali people. And today, many, many people among the Yali tribe have uh, become Christians, and, and they are no longer in the Stone Age to be praised. They are now built upon the rock of Jesus Christ. He's just one of probably thousands and thousands of people who were involved in a great conflict, great world conflagration that, that just, I mean, moved people. I, I think of uh, the story of Missionary Aviation Fellowship and how that started. Started at a Jack Wurtson rally. He was hosting an evangelism uh, meetings in New York City. And on one night, this was in the late 1940s, uh, I think, or maybe early 50s, uh, 1940s, um, some men came forward at a meeting as he gave an invitation to, to step out for Christians to serve the Lord. And these men came forward and they, they said, uh, Mr. Wurtzen, we don't have anything we really can do for the Lord. We're not well trained or anything. We're, we, just, we just fly some airplanes. We, that's all we are. We learned how to fly airplanes in, in the army. Today, missionaries throughout the world can thank the, the, the Missionary Aviation Fellowship missionaries who are out there, you know, hopping them all over the place through some very remote country and landing them in grass strips in the middle of the jungles and things like that. And they're doing that. And, and that started like that. Could anything good come out of World War II? Yeah. You know, all kinds of things. My mom's side, my grandmother and my grandfather met during World War II when they were both serving in the Navy. Wow. Like, thank you. I'm glad I'm here, I guess. Maybe you're not, but I am. I'll just say, I could go on and on and on, and I don't even know but a little piece of the picture. And that's our God. He's working right now. He's doing things. What will come out of 2020? Makes you wonder. I don't know. I just know this, that you better be following the same Lord who brought you into 2020 <laughs> and the one who is in control of all things. Oh boy, better move on here. We find that Jesus sent them, but he also saw them. He saw them. Mark 6, 46, it says in when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. And now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. 
Then he saw them straining at rowing. Now, I know that on a good, clear day, all right, in the day, you could maybe see out three or four miles, and you might, if you don't have binoculars, you would see, oh, there's a dot out there on, on the lake, the sea, maybe some men there, I don't know. I mean, that's a long ways to see. This is the night, and there's a storm, and Jesus sees them four miles away. How is that possible? Who could do that? And there wasn't any, even today, it would be very hard to see somebody even with specialized equipment in the middle of a storm. You're socked in. The visibility is not there. I don't care what you have. You aren't going to see very far. And yet, Jesus saw them. Shows us that he is the all-knowing God and he sees. He knew exactly what they were doing. He knew right where they were. He knew they were straining at rowing. They had gone out in the evening, and now it's the fourth watch of the night. That's through the night. And they've only gone about three, four miles, and they're straining at rowing. You know why they're straining at rowing? Because they're afraid they're going to sink. They're hoping they can get to the other side. I don't know if you've ever been out on a lake when things get choppy, and you didn't plan on it, and it's a little bit scary. Or, or in the ocean, it's even worse, right? Uh, I haven't had the, the, the privilege of being out in the ocean in really severe stormy weather. Uh, I've been out where it's, there's some heavy swells. Um, some of you that served in the Navy or the Marines, you know a lot more about that. But I, I'll say that um, the times I've been out on a lake where all of a sudden the wind came up and, and I was really fearful that things were going to, well, there was going to be more water in the canoe than out of the canoe. Um, that was a bad time, you know. These guys have been doing this all night, and Jesus sees them. Sometimes I kind of question Jesus. Jesus, why didn't you, why did, first of all, why didn't you just tell them, hold on, guys, don't get in the boat yet. Wait till morning. Well, the crowd wouldn't have waited till morning. He needed to send his disciples away, and Jesus needed to go to pray. Jesus, why did you wait so long? Come on, Jesus, get up off your knees. Come on, they're, they're, your, your disciples are going to drown. No, he knows right where they are. And he's interceding for them. And they're right exactly where he wants them. Because they had hard, hard hearts. And for these disciples, the only way they were going to get their hearts right again was in the middle of a storm. He's like that, though, you know. He doesn't just cast people to the wind. He doesn't just say, oh, you're on your own. Good luck. No, that's not the way it works. Matthew 12, 20 says this of Jesus. It's a prophecy from, I believe, Isaiah. It says this, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. Really what that verse says this, in, in the days when people would be walking around they might pick a reed out of the, the wetland or somewhere. And this is uh, something that was very common around the edges of the lake and things like that. And they would take that and make a little flute with it. And they were, the reeds were so common that when you bent them, a very fragile little piece of grass basically, and when you broke it, you would just throw it away. Not useful anymore. It's bruised. Or a smoking flax, that is... Essentially, a, a wick that is, is trimmed or not trimmed, and it begins to smoke and smolder. And the answer to solve that is to cut the wick. And what this says of Jesus is this, that he doesn't take a bruised reed or a bruised sinner and break you. Nor does he take something that is smoking, you know, it's not useful anymore, and just cut it off. Nor does he take a hard-hearted disciple and just send him out into the sea to drown. No, he's there and he's with them. John says, so when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. And they were afraid. They were afraid because... The other gospel writer says they, at first they think it's a phantom. That's the Greek word that's used. A ghost, a spirit. Now, 
I'm not saying there's things out there that do that, that appear and all that. I, I don't chase after ghost stories, those kind of things. But there are strange superstitions and things like that, and people have them, and sometimes Christians have those things too. And we hear something go bump in the night, and oh no, what's here? And the fear wells up in your heart. The disciples were no different. Many of them were fishermen, by the way, and you'd think if anybody was comfortable with bad weather on an open body of water, it would be fishermen, but they're afraid. Here's Jesus, and he goes from seeing them to walking near them. Wow. He's like that. And I'm so thankful that my Lord can be everywhere present. In currently in this, you know, he's given us the Holy Spirit. And God, the Holy Spirit, who Jesus promised would, he would send, and he did. He's like another comforter, another of the same kind. And the great thing about that is that the Spirit of God, who resides in the life of a believer, in, the, in, our, in us, we're sealed by him, he can be with us at all times, everywhere. For the disciples, Jesus walks on the water near them. And that reminds me, he, he intercedes on their behalf, but then he goes and he shows up with his very presence. His presence. I can say that that's something that is very powerful. I've often prayed around somebody, maybe, or over somebody that's going through a hard time, uh, some facing death, and I have said, Lord, may they sense your presence. My prayer does not create that, but it is biblical truth that we can stand on because he is present in the storms of life. He's, in, he's present even when we depart this life. In Acts chapter 7, when we see Stephen as he's being killed by his persecutors, and he sees the Son of God standing. He sees him. He's in his presence. He's waiting to welcome Stephen into the glories of heaven. Wow. I think at death we can also be assured we'll face something like that. You never die alone as a Christian, by the way. Never. That's one thing that's come out of this terrible coronavirus as people have died in hospitals and many of them have died as families have put it alone their family's not allowed to be with them at the worst time of their life when they're passing and they can't be there but i i rest in this that for the believer you're never alone for the person who's an unbeliever you are and you face death alone and you face death and the consequences of death and sin which is not only separation eternally from God, but separation in a place called hell. The Bible reveals that. It's an awful place. And I, today, as a believer in Jesus Christ, can face death. Oh, we'll be fearful of it most likely when it comes, unless it happens quickly. But I can say this, that the one who walked through death and rose again victorious over death will see me through that stormy sea as well. And you also. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. Then he saw them straining at rowing. You see where he sees them? Straining. And the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. So Mark includes the very time. It's, it's the worst, darkest time of the night, the fourth watch. And he came walking on the sea. And would have passed them by. And I often think of that because, you know, Jesus does not force himself on people. Sometimes Christians force themselves on people. But Jesus doesn't. Oh, he'll allow circumstances in your life to make you open to him, that's for sure. And I, th I think these guys, they were, they were desperate. This was such a bad time in their life that they would have taken anyone to come along and help them. But in particular, Jesus. Now, immediately they don't recognize him. They just see in the darkness something moving on the waves. I mean, that would be enough to scare you. But then they realize who he is because he calls out to them. They listen. 
Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 8 says, And the Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Hey, that's a good verse to memorize. It's a very good verse to post somewhere. I mean, where you'll see it all the time. All right? On the fridge door or on the mirror or somewhere, you know, superimposed on your eyeglasses. I don't know. Put it there. In the Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. And by the way, that verse... Capital L-O-R-D, that's the great I am. That's the one who revealed himself to Israel, right? Through Moses and all. And, he, and he, is, he's the, he is the creator God. And later on, you come to John's gospel. And the phrase in John chapter 8, will come to that, that Jesus uses is I am. He is the Lord. He is the one who back in Deuteronomy promised that he would not leave him. And in John chapter 6... Mark chapter 6, right? You have this beautiful picture of the Lord who will not leave them. Isaiah 41.10 Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. By the way, who's at the right hand of God? The Son. God the Son. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. He's in the place of honor, the right hand. And in the book of Isaiah, here he says, I will uphold you. Praise the Lord for that. Mark 6, 49. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. And they all saw him and were troubled. And it says, but immediately... He talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. You know what I love is that the Lord does not leave us with mouths wide open in fear. He speaks to them. By the way, He's spoken to us. The book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, God at sundry times and in diverse, who at sundry times and diverse manners spoke in times past, has spoken to us in His Son. He has given us his word. And he's given us the Lord Jesus. He's spoken to us. I don't care what this life throws at you. Uh, he, he, has, he speaks. And you have a Bible. I hope you do. And by the way, I, I'm thrilled to announce that um, this Bible project that we started back, actually Chris is here, Kristen, and back in uh, November at our missions conference, uh, those Bibles have all been gathered up and packaged and they'll be, are they mailed out yet? They were mailed out yesterday to uh, Monday or Tuesday. They'll be in the hands of some graduates here in the valley. So we just thank the Lord for that. And you know what? He speaks, doesn't he? And he says, be thou, you know, be not dismayed. Be not dismayed. Mark 6, 51. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. You know, what is demonstrated here is, is uh, several things. The first one is this, that we see his interest. He saw them, right? And he sent them. He saves them. But you see here uh, the, the peace of God. First of all, his presence, right? He was there with them. But then he gives them his peace. The winds cease. All right? What is a great storm becomes a great calm. But then we also see his power. His power to make the winds cease. And also his power to deliver them immediately to their destination. Then they willingly received him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. I could probably tell you more about that, but I, I was reading this during this week while I was preparing for this message, and I'm thinking, isn't that the way it's going to be for all of us? In this life, you're going to find yourselves in storms. The last big storm is when you face death, all right? 
And I think one of the, the things a pastor, uh, one of the callings I have, and I, I mean, it's just part of being a pastor, and some of you have served in that kind of role in ministry, and you know what it is. You, you have both a burden and a privilege to walk with people through those, those times, to prepare them for death, really to prepare them to heaven. <laughs> That's why I think churches are essential, <laughs> all right? At least churches that preach the gospel and preach the Bible and teach it and pray with people because they prepare people for the ultimate enemy, which is death. And, you know, the Lord gives us a peace in that. In John 6, 21 says, Then they willingly received him into the boat. See, they willingly received him. He would have passed them by, but they willingly received him. And, you know, you need to willingly receive him also. Jesus is there. He's here. He's among us. He is, is able to save anybody who will believe. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what Paul wrote in Acts, in uh, chapter 10 there. In Acts 16, a question went out to the Apostle Paul. Remember the, the account of the Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas have been thrown into a jail for the night, and they begin a jail ministry, all right? They begin, after being beaten and shackled and thrown into jail they begin singing and people are listening and there's a calamity that happens a great earthquake and the jail doors are rattled open it's the middle of the night and this jailer who was present or maybe even the one who beat them we find out that he springs in and he wants to kill himself he wants to kill himself because if these guys got out these prisoners and I'm not talking just about Paul and Silas, but some very hardened prisoners. This was in, you know, Philippi, the chief city of Macedonia. It was the, the prison of prisons. And you know what? If they're gone, that jailer was probably done. His job was done. His career was done, no, no doubt. And probably his life was at stake because he would have been held responsible for not guarding them properly. But instead, he finds that the prisoners are there, even though the doors are open. Which tells me that the singing of Paul and Silas must have been something really good. I don't know if they could sing well, but they sure could say some great words. Yeah, and I'll tell you, God had everybody's attention. He does that. He gets our attention. The jailer comes in, and this is what he says. He brings them out, and it says, Sirs, he said this, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let me tell you something. That's the most important question you'll ever ask in life. The most important question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Saved from what? Saved from your sin. Saved to serve God. That's what salvation means. Saved. Look at the answer. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And there's a promise to him, you and your household. His household would indeed follow in the same footsteps of faith. And they would be baptized, demonstrating their, their faith, their, what had gone on in their heart, publicly demonstrating that. And I look at that and I think, that's the way Jesus operates, by the way. You see... That Philippian jailer, he asked the right question, but then he did the right action. He trusted the Lord. You know, it's, it's interesting what people didn't, or what Paul and Silas didn't say. They didn't say, hey, you know, leave your money in the offering plate. Uh, you need to sign here with our church covenant. Uh, you need to join this group. You need to go on a pilgrimage to this place. You need to do this, or you need to say this prayer. or anything. You know what they said? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. It's that simple. We complicate it, but it's simple. You need to trust him. When John includes the story in the Bible of this storm, it really is a picture of, for us, faith in the storm. See, 
the faith of the disciples was wavering. The faith of the disciples was shallow. The faith of the disciples had become really a hard kind of faith in that they weren't trusting. And yet he abides faithful and he comes to them and then they invite him in. And when they invited him in, two things happened. Immediately there was peace on the sea and the second thing is that they got to their destination. And, that, and I just want to conclude with that. You know, a lot of us, as we get older, you, you, you're, I know I hear this all the time, we keep saying things like, boy, it's going fast. And, and life's like that. I'm 50 years old now, and 50 years has been very quick. I don't know what, the next 50 years, I won't probably live that long, but 50 years goes by, and, and I saw somebody here in the valley celebrating their 105th birthday, okay? And I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's quite an accomplishment. But, you know, most people say it's very quick. Remember Billy Graham at the end, nearing the end of his life, someone asked him about life, and he, and he said, what, did, what have you learned about life? And he said the brevity of it. It's brief. And, and that's true. That's what the Bible says. It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Life is like that. And there's a reason why we, as we age, it becomes in our mind anyways, connected, it seems like it's shorter and shorter and shorter. Because you see, when you're like five and you've got to wait a whole year to your sixth birthday, that's like, that's like you know, almost 20% of your life, right? At age five, it's 20% of your life, one year. And you're thinking, man, that's a long time. And it seems like it takes forever. Stuck in kindergarten. Oh man, is kindergarten ever going to get done? And then, you know, kind of get to grade 12 and you're like, well, you know, I guess it went pretty quick. But, you know, it's college, four years. Oh, boy, you know, or got to go here and join the military and be in there for four years or wherever, you know, people. We think of these little segments of life. And then all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you're 50 and you go, wow, that was quick. Or you're 105 and you say, Whew, man, just like that. As we age, each year becomes less and less, right? I mean, if I, 50 years, you know, that's 2% of my life. If I, you know what I'm saying? Like if you're talking in years, if I've lived at half, you know, it's, that's it. Yeah, if I died right now, right? And I'm just saying, I'm just saying this, that we don't know the days. We don't know how long we'll live, all that kind of stuff. But as you go on, it gets shorter and shorter. Someday we're going to be in glory, having invited Jesus into our lives, maybe many years ago from here, and it'll be like, I just went to the other shore. Just like that. Man, I just, I just invited him in, and now I'm there. Mark my words, someday maybe you'll think of that. Maybe not, I hope not. I mean, hope your focus is not on Jack Karen in eternity. But I'm gonna, I wonder someday I'm going to sit there 10,000 years into this and go, that little life I lived was nothing. One day I invited him into my heart and my life, and I trusted him by faith. I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and now I'm on the other shore, just like that. Oh, what great days. Father, we thank you for your word, and we even now just pray that you would place it deep in our hearts. And again, I just pray that if there's anybody that has not trusted you, has not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, that today they would turn from their sin and follow you, invite you in to their boat. And we just pray to that end, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and, and be dismissed this morning with this, another song. <clears throat> uh, in the back, right there. In Christ alone. And that is a good point. If we do have an offering plate out back and... Uh, so not to, I don't know, it's a, it's a minor thing, but we have been uh, not passing that around, obviously. And so uh, if you want to drop an offering there, that's where it is out back in, in that. All right, let's sing this song together. We'll be dismissed here this morning. <clears throat>